they got to be quiet out there, right? Yeah, right. Folks, welcome to a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show here at the Mesa Art Center. Uh, art of the Rhythm Section. Stop, Jake. Yes. Everybody in the back, we're just doing this, okay? Can we have quiet? Thank you. And uh, milestone moment in my career, uh, on, the, on the backs of uh, the real heroes of our society, melodic improvisers, Kenneth Barron, I'm going to call you Kenny, but Kenny, I, I don't call you Please. Kenny. All right, Kenny, Ron <laughs> Carter, Billy Cobb, and welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Can we say that all together? All together, all together now. All together now. <laughs> um, Ron, I wanted to ask you, um, did you, uh, do you believe that rhythm sections are the true creators of new musical vocabulary on the bandstand? Like what you did at, at the Plug Nickel. Larry Klein told me you, Tony, and Herbie took a blood oath that you were, I just would like you to go through the story of increasing musical vocabulary in the rhythm section. Uh, well, that's what Larry Klein, I'm not sure who he is, but uh, we never had a blood oath to change what we were playing. Could, I, I, I don't know that story. What's the story of the plug nickel, though? Because Miles apparently was, you know, you were bored to death of that stuff. Well, wait a minute. I mean, how are you hearing these stories? I don't know anything about that kind of stuff at all. I've been doing 3,500. I'm just at, how, does, how, how do rhythm sections increase wait, wait, musical wait, vocabulary? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Let's just get the ground rules straight here. If you ask me a question, I'm going to try to answer it. I don't know those rumors stuff about the plug nickel. All, all I can tell you is this. We didn't know it was recording until a year later when they put the record out. When? And really? someone gave me the record. So I took the record down to the union, took it to, to Columbia, they paid us whatever the scale was for a live recording. Mm -hmm. During the course of that same week, however, I commuted to New York because my son Miles was just born that week. So I lift, I play, play, the, play the, the show two sets a night, whatever it was. Take a two o'clock plane back to New York. It's like hour, not very long flight, two and a half hour flight. Get to New York at some like six o'clock in the morning. I either go to Manhattan for my theory class or I sit with my wife and a new baby until six p.m. that night. Take a take a plane back to Chicago in time for the first set. Did that for three nights. That's the story of Plug Nickel. Now, whatever room wow! Amazing. Wow! What a, well, that's an that's you can, whatever room you can just you can just put those rooms in the, in the local trash can. Yeah, they have nothing to do with that stuff. I, I'd like you to talk about thank you as a rhythm section, whether it's you and Billy, you and Tony. Do you believe that rhythm sections are responsible for new musical vocabulary? In and of themselves, no, but they certainly assist in that process. Explain if you could explain how. They have to trust that the. the, the Horn players, wherever they are, are aware of the backdrop of their solos, which is piano, bass, and drums in this case. And that I, I didn't put an impact on their solos to a major, for, to, to a major force in whatever direction they choose to take their solo. We're not individually responsible for them playing differently necessarily. As a group of three in this case, our individual concepts of how to play a rhythm how to play changes, how to be a presence in the construct of a solo, in monitoring the form, in maintaining whatever musical intent the band has. We share that responsibility. And depending on the horn player's ability to trust our judgment, to trust our direction of the music, hopefully it will help them play notes that they practice at home that don't work up tonight. They can find a new set of notes. I call it the kitchen solo. And the more we become accustomed to this horn player's ability or affinity for something new coming at him, depends on whether we are continuing to experiment with our own harmony differences and our own rhythm differences and our own physical dynamics. Uh, once we agree on a process that the rhythm section is a part of, that may make music and in itself move, but us by ourselves, I think we don't have that kind of sheer power to change the direction of music in and of itself. We help that process. We encourage that process. Could you give a time an example? First of all, people want you to project out because what you're saying is very inspiring. Can you talk about a time in your career when, when, when what you're talking about went down with you? All the time, man. It's going on, I discuss it tonight. Whatever we play. Explain how it goes on tonight. Uh, that's too complicated for a show, man. Okay. I mean, to, do that, to do that right now, 
take me at least a half hour because we haven't played yet tonight. I can tell you when it's all done. Right, but I mean, I guess what I'm talking about is like the, the transitions of, of jazz specifically have not grown very much. So what I'm trying to get at is like... The, the, the what hasn't grown? Like much? from going from bebop to post-bop, okay, there has not been new a lot of new language. So all I'm getting at is the idea of rhythm sections. If there was a time in your career early on in your career where you where you could talk about that that taking place. Uh, you know, I, can, I, I can't go back that far. I'm, I'm, okay, so I'm let me ask you one more question. One more question. You know? Well, wait. Let me just finish what he was saying yeah, at first. Yeah, you know, but that kind of question. Uh, I mean, we get deep in the weeds on my show, but I mean, I, I get it. You know, yeah, I'm not a weed guy. Though. <laughs> you're I'm, urban I'm, guy. I'm not urban a guy. Tea guy. You know, <laughs> a band pesticide. I'm into that kind of stuff. You, you this morning at the <laughs> at the um, at the. Uh, at the retreat, uh, you were talking about electric bass players. Yes. Um, getting over really, basically kind of, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want you to talk about the, the, the reasons why electric, electric bass players can get into a, a rut, so to speak. No, How, no, no, no. Yeah, I want you to articulate it. No, no, you didn't, I didn't say that at all. And I did, you didn't understand my words. I want you to explain it. Well, I'm trying to do that, but believe me, I would never say that they're in a rut. They do what they do very well. You may call it a rut, or someone else may not hear the difference, but I, I admire, as like I said this morning, I admire their ability to play the same line for the whole tune, whenever that tune comes along, and not vary that zone. To do that, man, takes a lot of discipline, takes a lot of determination, it takes a great deal of skill and a great deal of physical presence to play the same line for a James Brown tune, or a Parliament Funkadelic tune, or whatever that, that hot tune of the day is for the bass line for those music genres. The difference, I think, between their job and our job as the upright player is that our lines must contain something fresh and new every chorus. I resent that pressure, but I do it because it's part of the job. But I feel like my, my job is to find the germ of an idea during the first chorus. Mm and have a memory enough to be able to transfer and translate this germ to somewhere else in the next chorus, or somewhere else in the next tune, or somewhere else in the next night. Our job is to plant a seed and make it grow. It seems to me their job is to plant a seed and make sure that seed doesn't get past a certain height, and I admire that ability to do that. I'm not sure that I'd be as successful doing that, given my lack of needing to do that for a living, as theirs is necessary for their job. When you're at a like Billy Billy's uh, retreat here, how do you authentically teach cats that are playing the electric bass? I don't take them for students. I mean, I, I have a, a, a student in, my, in New York uh, who's part of a, a, a bunch of guys who come together on weekends to play music, and I'm determined to make him comfortable enough with playing changes. That he's more than a guy who plays bass on Friday and he's attorney for the rest for, for the other eight days in the week. I, and it isn't that I don't have interest. I just haven't had someone come to me and say, hey man, I want to know what you do. I want to show you, I want to show me how to play changes. No one has asked me that yet as an electric bass player. And uh, this guy did. So that's okay. These are the rules of my game. If you can fit into my schedule, let's make it work out. And we're having a great time. I'm having a great time. So am I. Uh, Kenny, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, a concept. Um, I was talking to a great piano player, Hubert Eves, and he was talking about um, listening to Otis Redding tune and the instant arrangements that occurred in the session. There was very little that was arranged, that was worked out in advance. They hit it on the first or first take, maybe. When you did your first album, how much instant arrangement was going on in the studio amongst the cats? Instant arrangement? Um, so what was my first record? Uh... Or the stylings of Bill Barron, even like that kind of. I want how loose was it? That's all I'm getting at. Uh, it was, was not over. You know, there was nothing more beyond a lead sheet, a lead sheet and changes. So whatever happened during the course of the tune, that's that's what happened. But there was nothing discussed. So let's do this here and this in the fifth bar. Let's do this. Uh, it was like it was just a, just a lead sheet and some changes and and whatever happened happened. And that was complicated music. To me, it was complicated music. Why was it complicated for you? Uh, he had a way of writing. I mean, he didn't use a lot of two fives and two five ones, you know. And he had this—the way he wrote chord progressions was really different 
for me, you know, and this is, I'm talking about 1960, uh, 59, 60, when I first, we first did a record. Uh, like his own unique styles, though. He really yeah, was totally yeah. in his own world. Yeah, so, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I think over the course of his life, his recorded life, I don't think he ever recorded any standards. Oh, he only wow. recorded Dig. his own music, you know. Until finally, I got the chance to record him, and we did some standards, you know. But he had a very unique way of writing, you know, so it's, you couldn't play your normal stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't play what you normally play. So, so in that sense, the music was very, very challenging, you know. Uh, but there was no, um, I don't think we even rehearsed. What did you have, what, what internally did you have to rely on in order to, to play the music, not just competently, but make it transcendent music? What were the, 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 yeah, the it was just whatever was spirit. in here. Yeah. You know, the heart. I mean, there was a little bit of this too, sure. obviously. Sure. You know, but whatever was in here, you know, you I kind of went with my gut and, and what I knew about core changes, you know, and kind of translated that to the way that he approached core changes. Because yeah, again, they were, they were for me they were unique. You know. Yeah, he, that... he used a um, a symbol. <coughs> uh, you know, and I don't know if you know much about the lexicon, you know, uh, a triangle means major, and then uh, a dash means minor. He used a square, and that meant no third whatsoever. So that meant the chord was ambiguous. You could make it major or minor. You know, so that that was a challenge. You know. <laughs> You know, the one thing you said to me in your apartment, um, it affected me a lot. I actually ask every cat now that when I, that I interview, um, I asked you what your intentions are now when you go out on the bandstand. And you said, it's always been to touch people's hearts. And I want you to know how, I want you, I want you to talk to the audience about touching, how to touch people's hearts in a, in a live musical performance. Because it was like, it was the greatest answer of all time. Well, I think it's just important to, to um... I, I mean, I once heard, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Khalil Gibran. He's a Lebanese poet. He wrote the, a book called The Prophet. Uh, of course. Yeah, okay. But he does a thing in there about music. And one of the things he says is that you can't make somebody cry. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. You can't make <laughs> somebody cry unless you can cry yourself. So in other words, you can't touch somebody unless you can be touched. You know, you can't feel something. I mean, you can't make somebody feel something unless you can feel it, you know, and that, I think that's important. You know, if you, want some, if you want to make somebody cry, then you have to, have, you have to feel that emotion in you, you know. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you. Well, when were you first touched musically, like where you all, felt? All the time, you know. I mean, when the first time I heard Train play a ballad, you know. Uh, the first time I saw Train at the... Uh, 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 at the showboat in Philly. And it was, there was so much passion. I had never heard a drummer play like Elvin Jones. You know, I mean, there was just so much passion there. They played one song for 40 minutes. It never got boring. You know, it was just, it was just exciting every minute. So that, that touched me, you know. To hear Tommy Flanagan play a ballad, you know, with that touch of his, you know, that, that's, that, that touched me. Um, actually, I was just going to ask you, I mean, Ron Carter got free bebop lessons from Barry Harris back in the 50s, but I want you to talk about why you love playing with Ron Carter. Me? Yeah. Oh, it's the most gorgeous sound. When was the first time you played with him? Oh, my God. When was it? Before 1977. <laughs> oh, way before, before 77. That. Way before that. Yeah. I think we did a record. When, anybody, when I... Damn near, Close to when I first came to New York, we did a record with my brother. Yes. <laughs> and, and it was, oh my goodness. Yeah, it was a Brazilian. Charlie, I think Charlie Persip. Yes, the drummer. Yeah, it was the yeah. drummer. Yeah. Charlie Persip was. Yeah. That was Persip. Yeah, and I think that was the first time we played together. Yeah. When did you start to begin to just read each other so well that it just flows? Like, just you guys played all styles of music just now during sound check, and it, it was. You know, it's just water. You know, when, when did it sort of become that, that way? Well, I don't know that it became that way. I think it was just that way. Just that way? Yeah, it was just that way, you know, from the first time we played together. You know, and, and that's the funny thing about this music. You can take three or four guys who have never, ever played together, never met each other, but sometimes everything just falls into place, and, and we all, we have a shared language that we all speak. 
you know, and given enough experience, I think we, we you know, it, it's, it's not a problem to make music well together, you know. It doesn't always happen, but nine times out of ten, it can happen, you know. I dig. Uh, Grandmaster Billy Cobb, I'm welcome, man. How are you? I'm doing quite well, thank you. Definitely project out so peeps, peeps can hear your voice, but um, can you talk about this shared language and how it's become a world language now? Uh, I look at how diverse it is because it was a, as Liebman, Liebman told me, you know, he was a white cat in a black subculture. And that's what this shared, shared language is. And now it's a world music. How has it changed? I think because of due to travel, the world has become a lot smaller. That means that many of the uh, personalities in this country have been able to uh, go forth uh, outside the shores and uh, spread the word, musical word, throughout the world. And uh, it's become a common, a common uh, thing, you know, to hear people playing together who come from all parts of the world. Maybe uh, hypothetically taking a, a song like uh, Ron's 81 and hearing somebody from India, literally from Madras, play that tune. Uh, uh, pianist and uh, bass player from Turkey in the same band. Uh, and, and, and you have all these combinations of people playing 81. When you hear it, you go, really? Yeah, it'll work. And, and it you know, it's because, and when, <laughs> the funny part is when you hear that, they, they, they turn around and say, hey, that sounds great. Say, you've been into these sessions? Yeah, I studied at Berkeley. <laughs> 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 and that's when I run the other way. But uh, mm. yeah, it's just amazing how many people have said that to me from, from uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, of course, China, uh, all over the place. <coughs> Everybody studied at Berkeley, and they know all these tunes that uh, you go, really? OK, that's amazing. Or the big one was for me, I was in, uh, in, in Budapest. And uh, I, was, I went to the, the local football stadium for a percussion festival. And the opening act was the, um, uh, was it the, uh, oh gosh, where's that place? Uh, what's, what's, Kublai what's, Khan, where did he come from? Um, the, oh, um, like Genghis Khan? Or something? Genghis Khan, where did he, uh, on the- Mongolia? Yeah, the Mongolian uh, <laughs> string jazz quartet. Wow. Yeah, wow. and they were playing Scrapple from the Apple. Wow. And when I saw <laughs> these guys, and they were playing these, these uh, bowed string instruments, mm. and uh, another guy was, uh, singing with the, oh, well, for me, it was like Oh, throat singing. Yeah, throat yeah. singing. And the, the drummer was all these tablas and a bass drum that he used one pat hit to hit it this way. And it worked, he, he was doing, and it was, he, it was amazing to hear this. And I went, no, Charlie Parker made this, the steps in Mongolia. You know, it's like, I couldn't believe it. it. Jazz had come to Mongolia. And they were in their, in their, traditional outfits yeah. and it was amazing to, to realize yeah this this music is a is a a positive virus you know it just everybody does it i remember reading herbie's book where he was talking about uh, at one time in europe the level of proficiency was not where it 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 was needed for him to do some work I think that's done now. Everybody's on an equal plane, pretty much. You know, it depends on what you, what you're seeking. You know, uh, in in a piece, they can play the notes. You know, but in their approach is going to be a specific approach. It's only based on where they live and what their history is. But at least the proficiency level is there. Uh, just to uh, to follow up on that, um, you know, Rick Murata will hear. Uh, someone playing drums in another room and he'll be like that's got to be a computer and he walks in and it's a it's a human being playing machine parts and I want you to talk about to to pe to musicians around the world about the need and pe people around the world about for authenticity in music it has to stay human 
Human rhythm specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when I, I go to China, <laughs> where there's a, a school called Nine Beat School, and there's 60,000 drummers in the school. Uh, wow. There's 400 schools around China. Mm -hmm. That's just a small school. And you go to the Be Beijing Percussion uh, Festival, and the kid walks up to me and says, Oh, Mr. Cobham, uh, I love your work. I'm a student of Dave Weckl. I go, yeah, what's your name? He says, my name is student of Dave Weckl. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, what's your real name? He says, student of Dave Weckl. And then he goes and he plays exactly like Dave Weckl. Alone. Mm. All the solos are, are, are alone. But, I mean, you know, I he's know, not playing with a band. Yeah. He's just playing a Dave Weckl solo, note for note. Is it, that good or bad? That's not good. Not for me, but, but I was shocked. I, I didn't expect that, and so mm. it caught me off guard. I mean, I, he was Just explain to the person why listening why, why do you don't like that. Explain, explain why. Because Dave Weckl already did it. Right. That's right. I'm just getting the, the authenticity part of this. Yeah. Original so sound. There's nothing, it, there's nothing to really write home about because Dave did it. it. He's saluting Dave, but I, I, I would prefer to have Dave and uh, I'll just salute him myself personally. Thank you very much, it's no problem. It would, it would also be nice to hear what this young man would do mm -hmm. yeah. himself. Never got that far. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, that, and that, probably that's never kind of will. the shame of it, no. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's no discussion about how to perform with others. It's just all about the drums. Mm. Here would be the whole gospel scene where a lot of these young kids or young people are playing are phenomenal patterns and all of this alone but it's more like a competition yeah you know who can play the fastest the longest the loudest in a cathedral mm. you know so it's like come on yeah. ron before before uh, we wrap up here um okay. i i just wanted to ask you um okay did you play uh the jazz chitlin circuit in Rochester or uh, any R&B circuits? I know you mentioned to me uh, that you played with Barry Harris and those are the best bebop lessons you ever got in your life. Well, I went on, a, on a, a brief tour with a gospel group in Rochester called the Traveling Six. The Traveling Six. Four voices, guitar, and bass for a brief tours. Uh, and uh, the Rochester situation, it was a trunk line going from Canada to New York by way of the, the railroad. The, uh, Little Falls, Herkimer, Utica, Syracuse, Rochester, uh, mm. ultimately uh, New York, Boston, going on down to the, the, the East Coast, Washington D.C., Baltimore area, and Rochester is one of the stops on this kind of uh, East Coast train tour, railroad train tour, that the band almost always did during the course of the spring tour. There was a guy named Ed Sarkeesian, who had a jazz package show called uh, Jazz, whatever the year it was. And the, the show that I saw had uh, Manny Ferguson's big band, Lambert Hendricks and Ross, Dave Brubeck, and Miles all on one program. And this show traveled on the East Coast, mm. which is where I saw Miles playing at the, Rochester, at, the, at the theater in Rochester the spring of 1958 with this big package show. Those days are gone, and unfortunately they are gone. Yeah. yeah. Sure, no, I wanted, but going back to the gospel group that you toured with, being that the, set, the PA systems were horrendous, what did, how did it help you, your ears grow on the bandstand playing that kind of music? The chords were pretty simple. It just a matter of can I maintain the intonation, intonation of the band and find out how to make them understand that the notes changing beneath them that they were not there the night before. And my job was to make them feel comfortable with how I saw harmony from the bottom up. Are you also advertising for electric bass players that, that you're, you want to give lessons to them? No, no, I'm, 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 I'm available. You're available. But they're not free. <laughs> <laughs> no way, man. You, you, gotta, you gotta pay. We don't do coffee in my house. <laughs> Kenny Barron, Ron Carter, Billy Cobham, thank you so much for being part of the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. All right.